Welcome to Homeward. I'm Jim Burns, and I'm very happy that you are with us today. Thanks for listening. And also thanks for all the great comments that are coming in on our podcast. So, you know, this is a new podcast, and I'm so excited that we get the chance to have a conversation today with my good friend, Bob Paul. And we'll talk about Bob in just a moment. But my goal here is to bring wonderful communicators who are experts in the field. And we have four values, strong marriages, confident parents, empowered kids and healthy leaders. And that's what we've been about for years and years at Homeward. And we'll continue to be about that. And today we're going to talk about strong marriages. Uh, Now, in order to journey toward a better marriage, uh, sometimes we have to demystify uh, what's going on. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We brought my friend and an expert. His name is Dr. Robert Paul. I call him Bob Paul. Uh, He's the vice president of Focus on the Families Marriage Institute and Hope Restored Marriage Intensives. And we're going to tell you about those because they're awesome, awesome, awesome. He's a licensed professional counselor and a major, in my opinion, uh, thought leader when it comes to marriages. And I just love this man. He's um, He and his wife, Jenny, live in Springfield, Missouri. I don't hold that against him. They have uh, four adult children and seven, counting, uh, grandchildren. He and Dr. Greg Smalley have written a wonderful book entitled Nine Lies That Will Destroy Your Marriage and the Truths That Will Save It and Set You Free. Bob, welcome to the broadcast. I've been so excited to have you on it. Oh, it's great to be with you always, Jim. Now, I, I need to tell you right now that I, I have a I have to pick a bone with you because we used to have lunch in Southern California because you'd come and see family but we don't get to do that as much anymore because the family moved. Yeah, they moved to another part of Southern California, so I'm not in your backyard all the time, so I miss you. That's not fair. You know, it's funny. Uh, there's that place that we go to, that barbecue place. I sometimes would go there, and I always think, wait, this is the place that Bob and I go. So, you know, we got we got to pull that together sometime. Hey, before we talk about the lies and the myths that can really, you know, do harm to a marriage, I want to do a backstory. And I actually read the backstory in your book. So I know, you know, you've talked about it. Uh, You know, Greg grew up in a home with Dr. Gary Smalley. I mean, a a, a mentor in my life. I I know in years and you wrote with Gary Smalley, you wrote the DNA of relationships, which was an incredible book. Um, But, you know, he came from a, from an authentic Christian leader's home. Greg did. On the other hand, you were born into a family that really didn't have as much of a Christian background. In fact, in the book, you said, you know, my family was kind of new agey and you became a late, a Christian later in life. And, and interesting enough though, your family was very uh, strong when it came to marriage enrichment. And, you know, there were some books written that were amazing and actually huge sellers and kind of almost, uh, you know, counselors to the stars in Hollywood. So what was it like being raised in a home? You know, here's Greg saying, yeah, my dad was a Christian. My mom's a Christian. You know, we, we do Christian stuff. You were raised in a home that wasn't that way. What was yeah, it like? My home was, yeah, my home was absent of anything religious, anything faith oriented. That, that, I mean, they, they did become more new agey in my teens and so forth. But prior to that, there was a complete void there. Yeah. Um, but they did become, my dad and my stepmother did really become a therapist. And because we were in West Los Angeles at the time, uh, they ended up becoming pretty prominent and, and they had a lot of very, uh, celebrity oriented clientele. And, uh, yeah, it was interesting because they were movers and shakers in the field. So I grew up around that and, and was influenced by the thought process. And matter of fact, there was a period of time where my parents were like my idols. So much like Greg Smalley, we both grew up being influenced by our parents' thought processes and it influences the way I th- the, the way I thought. And never in a million years, Jim, did I realize how much the Lord was preparing me for what He had for me. Yeah. Because I just learned from a young age to think this way, yeah. and it has deeply influenced everything I think and I do. Yeah, isn't isn't that great? You know, I think, and I wasn't raised in a Christian home, and and yet I learned a lot from my parents. I mean, they my I didn't have the wounded. My parents were good people. There was alcoholism in the family, but. But I think partly God gives us our parents for certain reasons. And reading this book, I actually saw some things that were really healthy from your parents' material that, you know, you brought to this material. Well, I want to get into it because you talk about these lies and these myths, if you would, that can damage it. And I just, I smiled through reading this book. And this is actually the second time around for me reading the book because I'd read it when you, when it first came out. And, uh, there's kind of this first lie, and, and I bought into this. Boy, I'd become a Christian. I'd been a Christian for a couple of years when I started dating Kathy. 
And I call this the fairy tale marriage or what you said is, and they lived happily ever after. Now, for me, the shock was we said, I do, I will, I love you. And we thought because we were Christians and in ministry, it was going to go well. And we had a really, really hard first year. And we were shocked because we figured all Christians, you know, just had lived happily ever after. Speak to that myth. Well, I think, first of all, before we get into the specific myth, it's worth noting that, you know, being a product of our culture, um, I would say that there's there's ways in which I bought into all of them uh, mm -hmm. because it really is what our culture teaches. Yeah. Um, you know, what we found in the work that we've done with, with through our therapy work is that um, many people are set up to fail in their relationship because they're taught things to um, believe about the way relationships work and the way they're supposed to operate in relationship. And when it doesn't work, they aren't thinking that it's because it, it can't work. They're thinking there must be something wrong with me or must be something wrong with my spouse. Maybe I got a defective spouse. And rarely does it turn out to be the people that are the problem. It's that we're believing things, we're trying to use strategies that, are, that mm. cannot work and we don't realize that. So because we were taught by well-meaning people. So this first lie, you know, the way our culture works, I totally bought into. Uh, it never dawned on me that it was a fairy tale because I thought like you, that when I get married, that I'm gonna be, that, that I'm gonna be happy and that the measure of a marriage is whether or not the people in it are happy. So therefore, if happiness is fading, either the marriage obviously is fading and if happiness is gone, the marriage is gone. And, you know, our culture teaches that, you know, we're supposed to be pursuing life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I mean, it's yeah. built into the direct declaration of independence. So, so that was a tough one. It, it didn't dawn on me at first that it was a fairy tale. Yeah. And I think we need to shout that out, that it, it isn't all about happiness. Um, I remember an experience when, when Kathy and I had first gotten married, I was a youth pastor at a church, and we would argue on the way to church, and of course, then I would speak on the joy of a Christian family to those kids, feeling somewhat <laughs> hypocritical, right? And there was an elder in the church that told me that they had never fought. They just didn't fight. And so I bought that because my parents sure fought, but they weren't doing it from a Christian standpoint. This was an elder in the church. And uh, you know, seven years later, they got a divorce. And so I don't know if they didn't fight, and maybe they didn't because they were bearing stuff or whatever, but um, it was a really insightful thing for me seven years later that, wait, these people weren't right. Um, and that, yeah, there, there are going to be uh, issues there. Uh, how do we, how do we rectify that? What do we do to, you know, buy, we bought into it, but now we, we, we have to change. What's the positive side to that? Well, I think it's important to recognize that, first of all, it's important for us to state here that we're not anti-happy. I mean, I'm all about happy, and I do believe that more happy is better than less happy. So yeah. it's not like we're saying you just need to suck it up and, and, and it's going to be miserable and okay, deal with that. What we're saying is that the measure of a marriage can't be about happy because there are just things about life in this fallen world that don't lend themselves to happy, and happy wouldn't be an appropriate reaction to some of the stuff. Some of the stuff we're seeing in our culture right now is not leading people to feel happy. Um, so the key is that the change for me was when I realized that when I was choosing Jenny to be my wife, I wasn't choosing my happily ever after partner. Mm. I was choosing my journeying partner. Mm. My wife is the person that I journey with through good times, through bad times and sickness and in health till death do us part. This is my, this is my friend. This is my, this is the person that when some of the challenges of life come our way unexpectedly. We, we rally together and find a way to have each other's back yeah. and be there with and for each other during the ups and downs, yeah. which are going to be inevitable right. as a married person in a fallen world. Oh, that's really, really, really good. There's another myth, and I think a lot of us buy into the myth. We buy into it, on, in, and you mentioned this in your book, we buy into it when we do the unity candle, which is still popular, not as popular, but it's one plus one equals one. And you go, oh, no, that's a lie. That's a myth. Well, and yeah, the, and, and I hate the unity candle. As a matter of fact, I've got to the point, Jim, where uh, I'm all about marriage. I love marriage as a, as a relationship, but I hate weddings uh, I, 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 because, I, you know, I've spent a life as a therapist, a marriage therapist, 
And I have to unravel these lies in people's lives, these messes they get themselves into. And I hear, I hear people being set up for frustration and failure on a regular basis. And I'm telling you, when I'm sitting in the pew at a wedding, they start saying this stuff from the pulpit and I'm wanting to stand up and start shouting, no, you're setting them up to need me. It's like I want to hand them my card at the end and say, you know, hey, you probably need to hold on to this. You're probably going to need it. And here's what my problem is with the unity. <laughs> After coming candle. down the aisle, it's probably not the smartest thing yeah. to hand them your card yeah, right, right. now. Like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a killjoy at a wedding. Right. But uh, um, so so this is what I'd struggle with with the unity candle. You know, the way this, the ceremony, the symbol works is you light these individual candles that represent the two people. And then they take the candle and they light the center candle that represents their marriage. Okay, and then what do they do? They go, and they blow that out. And that's where I'm fit to be tied because in reality, um, of the three parts of now a marriage, the husband and the wife and the relationship, only two of those are eternal. And it's not the marriage. Jesus made it very clear that we will not be married in heaven. If we're believers, we'll both be there, but we won't be married anymore. Now, my little human heart who adores my wife can't imagine us both being there and she not be my wife anymore, but Jesus said it. And I assume that the day I get there, he's gonna put his arm around my shoulder and say, hey son, here's how it goes. And I'll go, oh, okay, that's cool. But um, at this moment, I can't wrap my mind around it. But right. this problem with the symbol is it basically suggests once you get married, you take your focus off the people and you put your focus all on the relationship. And that's bad theology because the people are eternal, not the relationship. Now, I'm not saying don't focus on making the relationship great. Yes, but not at the exclusion of making sure the people are whole and healthy because yeah. Jesus came to die for people, not marriages. Well, even on a even on a spiritual uh, degree here, you know, Jesus said, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. Yes. I'm not talking about sexuality, but we've over-spiritualized that, that the two become one. And that and that scripture is oftentimes used in that unity candle. Right. And I think that symbolically, we the, the way one is one of the problems with us in our in our, in in an English speaking culture hmm. is that the word one has multiple meanings. And if you think we're talking about going from two to going to one, that's where the problem is because yes. theoretically, uh, theologically at that point, oneness is being referred to is being meant to be understood as unity, yeah. oneness of spirit in spirit yeah. and purpose, yeah. not the two become, I mean, I mean, I've seen you and your wife and you are, if that's the case, you're oneness failures, because I, yeah. every time I see you, I see two and yeah. Jenny and me, oneness failures, but right. we are in unity. We are one yeah. in spirit uh, and it's purpose. A, it's, a, it's a great reminder for a lot of us who do, you know, people do uh, sometimes I think over spiritualize that. I don't mean that as in a bad sense, but yeah, I think you're right. Here's another myth. And this one got me too, because we seem to talk about this a lot within the Christian world. I must sacrifice who I am for the sake of the marriage. I thought you guys did a great job talking about this, uh, and and no doubt there's sacrifice in marriage, but oh. but this I must sacrifice myself. What, what what did you mean? Yeah, I think that there's a, an unfortunate misunderstanding about what it means to sacrifice. I mean, obviously, to be a believer sacrifice is going to be required. I mean, and Jesus, you know, paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. I mean, he gave his yeah. life for us. That's a pretty serious sacrifice. Sure. And I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to give of myself. Now, a couple of things. First of all, one of the areas where we get stuck is that many of us in the faith um, present the idea that I am basically of low value, kind of a worm, um, you know, uh, not very valuable in and of myself. It's only in Christ that I have value, which clearly isn't true. I mean, the Lord made it clear that we are so valuable to him as precious children that he was willing to come and die for our, yeah. for us and yeah. our well-being. That's of high value and that he created me on purpose with purpose. And he wants me to value me as he created me, not to see myself as less than, not to see myself as needing to be changed. Because if I do anything to change me or to change Jenny, which I did a lot of attempting to change her, I'm immediately at odds with the creator who made me this way. 
And I'm basically saying, you did something wrong. You made something. And I used to whine and complain. Why did you make me this way? Why didn't you make me more like Jim? Or why didn't you make me more like whoever? And he basically put me in my place and said, Bob, I realize that you're unhappy with the way I created you. But I just need to remind you, you were not on the design committee when we when, when I created you. I didn't ask your opinion. I didn't need your opinion. I am perfectly satisfied with the way I created you yeah. and with what I created you for. And if you would just, if you really want to please me, just be the best you you can be and do what I brought you here to do, and we will be completely satisfied. Well, now, now, this is one of the themes that I that I read over and over again in your book is if I could be the best me, I'm going to be a better, I'm going to have a better marriage. And if Kathy could be the best her, we're going to put our two best together, and that's going to make it much healthier than me being a doormat or sacrificing or even being a codependent or whatever. Yeah, and this isn't about, this isn't like the culture teaches. This isn't about making it all about me. No, right. I want to be... Th- I want to be as close to who God created me yes. to be yeah. as I pos- That's what I mean by the best me. Yeah. It's not if it feels good, do it kind of a thing. It's that yeah. I want to be who God created me to be. And I want to, I want to clarify and identify what he put me on yeah. this earth to do yeah. and get as close to doing that for his sake, yeah. for his purposes to be fulfilled. And that's what puts me, that's what makes my life make sense. It's what I, w- what I was created for. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's great. Uh, codependency, you know, sometimes people sacrifice because they're codependent. My my family of origin, my my dad was um, an alcoholic, functioning alcoholic, and actually a really good guy. Um, it got to him later in life, and he became sober at sixty nine. I mean, it's a neat. I have a great story with my dad, but my mom was a codependent, and she was lovely. I mean, she was my favorite, most inspirational person in my life, but she she was totally a. a a codependent. Now she wasn't coming from a Christian background, but I think her thought would have been, no, I sacrificed me to help, you know, this guy I married. Yeah. Talk about codependency a little bit. I I was a card carrying codependent. I believe that, and this is what I mean by that. It's a good psychobabble term. So, you know, I'll I'll flesh out what we actually mean. Yeah. You need to. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I went, I went into the marriage believing that Jenny was supposed to meet my needs and I was supposed to meet hers. Mm-hmm. She was supposed to care for my heart and I was supposed to care for hers mm-hmm. and those types of things. And um, the, the problem I had, which turned out to be a blessing, is my wife doesn't have a codependent bone in her body. When I was trying to hand those responsibilities off to her, she's pushing it away. And I'm thinking, she doesn't love me because if she did, she would want to do that for me and I would do that for her and we could live together in codependent bliss. But, uh, <laughs> but the reality is that was never the way it was meant to be. I'm supposed to look to him to be my source, not her. Yeah. And and to give from my abundance. Now I sacrifice for my wife. I give generously for her, but I then go back to him to refill. I don't go to her to fill me up. Yeah. I go to him to refill and then I give and then I fill and then I give and then I fill. And that allows me to keep giving of high quality and, and generously from a place of abundance, not a place of emptiness. Yeah, boy. That's great. I hope everybody caught that. That's that's so key. Uh, you know, people come to you, and, and again, this is even part of what your work is, and we'll get into that at the end of this podcast, but uh, people will come and say, we have irreconcilable differences. They're just, yeah, it's just not working. And what is usually at the root of that when they say that? Is there hope know, for them? Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, it's probably the most cited reason for divorce today. Yeah. It's simple. It's an easy one. You don't even have to, you know, you don't have to have any other cause other than you decide your differences are irre- irreconcilable. But the, the problem with that, Jim, is it, it suggests that differences are the cause of trouble in marriage. Hmm. And what we've come to realize is that differences are actually never the problem in marriage. We are different because God made us that way. Matter of fact, if Jenny and I were identical, one of us would be unnecessary. Right. You know, uh, you know, uh, differences. Any any time you're on a team, you know, a great team is always going to be a group of people who who have differences and they play to each other's strengths and they cover each other's differences, and that's what makes the team thrive. And so Jenny and I are different on purpose by design, and those differences are meant to be of value. So the problem is in marriage, 
not knowing how to adequately value the differences and how to fully utilize them as they were intended. But the differences themselves are not the problem. Very interesting. I mean, we have to, I had to learn how to, how to accept that with, with Kathy, because what drew me to Kathy, I'm an extrovert. She's an introvert. So that drew me. I love that. When we got married, I'm having a shallow conversation with everyone at the party, and she's having a conversation with one person on the sofa changing their life. But I'm mad at her because she hasn't had a shallow conversation with everybody else, right? And I had to learn to embrace that. I'm, I'm less detailed than she is. She would, she's not here, so she, can, she might say a little flaky, but I'm, I'm saying less detailed. Doesn't that sound better? But you know, there's a number of things that I had to learn to embrace. What do you suggest to somebody who's saying, you know what, I'm really having trouble with these differences. In the book, you said opposites attract, in parentheses, it said, and divide. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it's interesting because we've got a cliche to cover it all, you know, because we do say opposites attract, but we also say birds of a feather flock together. So which is it? Well, it's both. You yeah. know, I mean, it, you know, people, anybody can be attracted to pretty much anybody. Um, I do think that the differences can be awkward because uh, unlike you guys, we're the opposite. I'm more the introvert, even though I love people. And yeah. Jenny's the extrovert. Jenny gets charged at Christmas time going to a crowded mall. And that's not a place I would want to step foot in at Christmas time. I mean, I just feel crowded and, and, and uncomfortable. Um, and those can create you know, that can create awkward. I want to, I want to recharge my battery by going into my cave and Jenny wants to go out and be with people. And that doesn't charge me. That wears me out. Hmm. Um, so we've had to learn how to value those differences. I think, yeah. as you were saying with Kathy and how to make good use of them as they, as they have the potential to benefit us, but on the surface, they can become quickly irritants, even though at first we were fascinated by each other. They become right, right. more irritants, and we got to learn how to see them differently. Yeah, le learn how to see them differently. That, that's very good. Listen, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we'll be right back. Uh, don't forget to also subscribe to the podcast if you can. And you can always watch this podcast, see our beautiful faces, on uh, the Homeward YouTube channel. And when we come back, I want to talk to Bob about, I think, one of the most important things I've heard him speak on and then write on also in this book. And it's called The Heart Talk. And I want to bring that up. But right now, we're going to take a real quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Jim Burns. Homeward, you're listening to. Uh, Dr. Robert Paul is with us today. And again, he's written a great book. And we have this all in the podcast notes. You can see it and you can see how to get this. The book is called Nine Lies That Will Destroy Your Marriage and the Truths That Will Save It. Uh, and set you free. And he wrote that book with Dr. Greg Smalley. It's a great combo. Those are great. They're very good friends, and they just did a great job putting this together. Bob, before the break, uh, we were talking about how opposites attract and divide and how we have to accept that. But you have a, a, a concept that's called the heart talk or the heart. Yeah, the heart talk. And I want you to I want you to describe that because I feel like that's really helpful, especially for people if they've been buying into these lies. How do they how do they you know, deal with their heart. What would you say? I think, the, I think the thing that's so important about that, Jim, is that many people in our culture, and it's not always this way, but, but gender stereotyping a bit more commonly men hmm. have come to believe that feelings um, are more of a nuisance, especially certain feelings. Some of the more vulnerable feelings are more of a nuisance hmm. than anything. And um, in reality, they were all feelings are morally neutral data and they were created by God on purpose with purpose. And one of the um, one of the most important aspects of feelings is that they are what enable us to connect on the more deep, profound, intimate levels. An intimate connection is always a heart to heart connection, an open heart to open heart. And feelings are the substance of that connection. So if you have people that only do what we call work talk, which is when you're talking about all the facts and figures and getting stuff done and strategies and that kind of stuff. If you, t if you have two people that only have that kind of conversation and ask them how they would describe what their relationship feels like, they would commonly say it feels more like a business partnership. And sometimes they might even say we're like business partners who don't even like each other. <laughs> and, and really what, what we find is that for people who are all built to long for this deeper bond, this deeper connection, the only way to actually get there is to be able to speak heart to heart and talk about what we're feeling, what we're wanting, what we're afraid of, what we're dealing with, what our dreams are, what our concerns are. Those are the places where we bond. Well, and, and 
What do you say to the couple who comes in and they want that? I mean, everybody wants intimacy and I'm, I'm calling that connection, but right. sometimes they don't know how to do it. And you were talking about right. in general, you know, men are worse at, you know, kind of dealing with their emotions and, and whatnot. They want their hearts to come together. What are some practical ways of bringing your heart together uh, and kind of getting a win out of this? Well, and to your point, one of the one of the things about the tool heart talk is all it is is a, is a, a series of steaks, just three steps for the, yeah. speak, the speaker and the listener. It's very yeah. simple. It's the simplest version I've seen yeah. that create like um, emotional guardrails for your communication right. vehicle to keep you out of the, the communication ditch. That's all it is. It's not like they're magical. It's not like they're they're essential. They're just a way to make sure you can safely yeah. and effectively discuss what's going on in your heart and hear what's going on in your spouse's heart, even when they're different, and making sure that it stays safe and secure in that conversation so nobody walks away feeling like they regret having had the conversation. Yeah, and what I like about what you in your book is you know you'll give content but then you also have these i mean they you, they can work through the questions and the, and there's diagrams and all those kind of things and i think that's really really helpful i think sometimes the two well at least me when i'm speaking on something if i don't give practical tools well, what you did is you you would you would write something you and greg and then you would give the practical tools to okay now work through this and develop those guardrails some people don't do well with the with, if they don't know what questions to ask or they don't know how to deal with the guardrails it can kind of well go off the rail and uh, i appreciate that you know very very much conflict now I, you know both in this book and in other things you've written so give us some insight on you know the couple who's just conflicting like crazy uh what what would you say to them you know drop some wisdom on us here with if they're saying wait i'm in a lot of conflict well there's a couple of things that we can talk about regarding conflict one we've identified that underneath all conflict in any relationship but especially in marriage is a thing we call the reactive cycle so and it's basically everybody experiences it in one form or another but you know something triggers me and my button gets pushed and i react which triggers jenny and her button gets pushed and she reacts which re pushes a button of mine and i react and we spin in a miserable cycle and the cycle is the same the details will be different because the people are different what our buttons are will be different how we react will be different but the cycle is the same so we line that out and we give you the opportunity to figure it out for yourself there's, there's tests you can take. We even got an online test that can help you find your cycle. Uh, yeah. You go to reactivecycle.com and, and you can take it and see what how it plays out. Yeah. But what we found is that in terms of working through it, once you realize what's going on and we teach you how to break it, um, that we, we give you some steps to resolve conflict. We call it the steps to a win-win, seven steps to a win-win. Yeah. And the bottom line is we believe that our God is is all about unity and his interest and desire is to help couples be in complete and total unity with each other and with the lord all the time the enemy doesn't want that but 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 the lord does and there is a way in which we can take we can go through that and it's interesting that at hope restored and at focus we don't teach compromise contrary to what is taught by many people in our field. We never encourage couples to compromise because hmm. who wants to live with compromise? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we teach people to, to ask the Lord to help them find a, a, a solution to virtually any contact on conflict that they both feel great about and not settle for less. And we find that the Lord consistently will take us there if we can just get the heck out of his way and allow him to. No, that's really, really good. Tell me the name of the, uh, you, you said something.com, and I want to put it in our in our podcast notes. Reactivecycle.com. Dot com. Okay. That's great stuff, by the way. I, you know, as, as Bob was talking about it, and I was, I was thinking, oh, that's right. I've been helped so much by much of his writing in that, in that area. And there's some great things you can, you can uh, deal with. Now, Bob, you run something called the Hope Restored Intensive. You don't, you're not at every one of them, but you lead this incredible ministry. As you know, I love this. I've sent people through the intensives and they, you know, they come out different people. I have, I have wonderful stories uh, about people coming who I honestly thought, oh, they don't have any hope. Okay, here you go, Bob. <laughs> and, uh, and they come out different. And so I want you to tell us about Hope Restored. Um, I was at Windshape last weekend speaking. I was actually 
stay, Kathy and I were staying in the rooms where they do these beautiful intensives. We were staying in one of the bedrooms, but then of course there's a there's a meeting room, and it's it's life changing. It's in, it's it's the best I know. I mean, you know, I know this. I'm I, I, I that I'm totally sold on what you're doing. Tell us about it, and then tell us how they can get some information about it as well. All right, well, we, you know, being being therapists and 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 being influenced by my family, I learned about doing intensive therapy, which is different than the typical yeah. hourly, weekly sessions. You know, and and th that can be really profitable, really valuable. It can be really frustrating for couples that are struggling because you know it's hard to unpack all of that in an hour and then you got another week or two before your next session and stuff happens and then you come back and you got to try and unravel the stuff that happens and it's just hard to make progress well we work for multiple hours uh, in cons on consecutive days anywhere from three to five days depending on the program that you choose and we have a success rate that is second to none in the world yeah. we've now we now have five locations in the united states and three in canada We've seen over 13,000 couples from all over the world, and we have this incredible. We have almost 100 therapists now working for us in these locations. So it's it, and our success rate has been consistent for virtually you know a quarter century, over 25 years. It's been now that we've been doing these, and um, so that's what we do. We we meet consecutively because when you can work for a number of hours at a time. Um, and then we have breaks and we have meals and we put people up in these beautiful locations where they're being pampered by our team. Right. And um, but it gives you the chance to really get to the heart of things, to really get to the root so that, you know, that that you can you can then be you can see what you're actually dealing with down deep and then find ways. We give you these tools and strategies to actually make it different going forward. It's not just about, you know, good luck. I hope it works. We're giving you, you know, really well practiced and, and um, um, research tools that we know work. We, work. we use them ourselves, that we don't teach theory. If we can't make this stuff work in our own marriages and our own lives, we don't teach it to anybody. So we know this stuff works and we've got it's, it's documented so evidence to the case. Yeah, so, so, so great. You know, somebody once said, uh, as a Christian educator, somebody once said, you know, give me two uh, retreats a year and I'll do more and better Christian education than 52 Sunday schools. They weren't burning on Sunday school. They were just saying, sometimes you can get more done in, in a retreat type setting. And this, this is different than the kind of retreat you've been on on your church. But if you go, the intensive is great. You know, people come back and say, oh my gosh, this was life-changing. It was a breakthrough. What they also say is the food was great and we felt pampered. And I love that you said that because there's an element to that that's that's important too. They they meet some other people who are going through some of the same things. So anyway, I really, I, I highly recommend it. We'll put it down also in our podcast notes and you can find that uh, anywhere and uh, and find out more about Hope Restored. I really challenge you, if, if you're in a place where you feel stuck, and I mean stuck, you know, take a look at that. Uh, Bob, our time went by so fast. Thank you so much. I mean, the book is called Nine Lies That Will Destroy Your Marriage. And then they build you back up with lots and lots of good stuff. And, and I just appreciate all that you do, who you are, and just the thought leader that you are, and really the human being, the, the man of authenticity and integrity that you are. Well, thank you. And I treasure our friendship, Jim, for all these years. And yeah. uh, um, I mean, it's just, it's a delight to do the show with you. Now, this, thank of course, you. is the YouTube channel because you can't see us instead. But, you know, we used to have hair. I promise you that we used to have more hair. He has more <laughs> hair than me, but we used to have hair. Uh, hey, before clear. we go, let me just, I want to tell you a story. I was thinking about this. And, and, you know, this is a story that I actually read in New Yorker magazine, which I don't subscribe to. And I don't really, I don't know how I got this magazine article, but it was an amazing article. And it was a woman started by saying, I committed adultery. And she went on to say that, you know, she and her husband had two kids and they were, you know, busy, busy, busy and, you know, just chaotic. And they were strangers, as Bob said, you know, they were, they, they, we were, we were literally in a business relationship. And there was a guy at work and he paid some attention to her and, you know, it started innocently. And then there was an emotional affair and turned into a physical affair and she got caught and uh, there was a divorce. And she now takes us to her parents' 50th wedding anniversary. And actually her ex-husband is there with the kids. And the kids are sitting on grandma and grandpa's lap and uh, the ex-husband is there. And, you know, she's kind of at the, at, at the back. She's just watching this, observing. And by the way, the relationship hadn't worked. It would, had been physical in nature. And, you know, now she's alone. And 
she started thinking about her parents and she said, you know what? My parents probably didn't have the physical ecstasy that I had had in this affair relationship, but they made it. What, what's the answer? And all of a sudden it dawned on her as her kids were sitting on their lap and everybody's celebrating. She said, you know what? It's the P word, perseverance. Now, I know that doesn't sound very romantic and it doesn't sound very uh, spontaneous, but what they did is they persevered. They leaned into it. They learned about what lies and myths and how they could you know, take those lies and myths and turn them into something beautiful and, and change their marriage and change the way that they went about things. And uh, you know what? She looked at it and finally said, I should have persevered. And do you know this, that if you have a troubled marriage, and this is latest research, that 78% of people who say that they're in a troubled marriage, if they'll stay for five years, 78% say that their marriage is better off. Does it say it's perfect? No. But as Bob said at the beginning, you know, we're not meant to be totally happy in our marriage. We're, we're not, we're, he even used, uh, he and Greg used in their book, you know, the Westminster Confession, you know, that we're to enjoy God and, and serve him forever. And in doing that, then we come together. But in doing that, please know that there's lots of help for you. And at Homeward, we want to help you. Um, what Bob is doing with Focus on the Family and with Hope Restored is incredible. And, uh, you know, lean into it. There's help for you if there's any kind of an issue. And even I say this all the time, but communication, it's a learned trait. You can relearn how to communicate in a more effective way as a couple. It's just a matter of taking the time to do it in the middle of, you know, our busyness and chaos. We we have to make this, you know, as a, as a top priority. Sometimes I'll say, do your kids a favor and love your spouse. So, you know, please make sure to take some time and energy to, you know, work on your marriage on a regular basis, even if it's a, a weekly date night, even if it's, you know, just interfacing on a day-to-day -day basis for 10 minutes um, in the midst of it, that's going to help you, you know, get to a better place uh, in your marriage. And I think that helps you get to a better place in your family. I think because Kathy and I worked on our marriage, we're in a better place with our family, with our parenting. It's not perfect, but it's, it's better. And, um, and we've been at it for a long time, but we realized we have to make that a priority. So anyway, thanks, Bob, again, thanks so much for being on. I appreciate you so much. It's a delight. And, uh, by the way, thanks again to our producer, Mike Segovia. Love this man, Lisbeth, who was a part of this, uh, podcast as well. And, uh, thank you for making this podcast possible. You can get to us. You can go to homeward.com and learn more about Homeward and all the great things going on at Homeward.